Hi there, this is the first or the second to the session of uh, OpenGL. I'm learning OpenGL, and I thought I'd pass on the knowledge to anybody that's actually interested in it. And also, just for my own sake, just to actually uh, clarify and, and detail exactly what I'm going through. Um, I've created this project based on Nuhi's uh, project here. And uh, this right here is actually my own um, mutations of what he had. So I've actually taken my, my own code and moved it around, so I actually have the capability to move around with the OpenGL space on an X, Y axis, or X, Z axis, my bad. And you can actually, I put in some mouse looking here too to make it easier. So you can actually move this to the separate coordinates that springs back to the, to the point that you had to begin with. Um, what I've done is here on the, on the sides, I've put an OpenGL cylinder. I move that in time based on a, a certain constant speed, and, um, and the same thing holds true for the for the ceiling too. The ceiling. Now I can actually move back and forth and see the, see the ceiling. Now what I've also done is I, I've uh, created uh, some capabilities to move up and down with the mouse. So here I'll just demonstrate real quick. This is the mouse wheel that's actually doing that. So you can't see the mouse wheel outside. And you can also look around, too. So this is the ability to look around. Now the, the cylinder section here is clearly slanted. Now what I do not have on this is, is collision detected. So I can pass right through the walls like this. And you can see my skybox. And this is actually a real photo that was taken with Google, uh, Google, uh, was it, uh, Google Street View. And it has the capability to be able to do a panoramic 360 degree view. So I actually, what I did was I um, stitched those together. You can actually see the stitching right there. It doesn't look uh, all that great. So it's a little bit unseamless at points. There's a seam that's actually a little bit uh, interesting to see too. And I just stitched all these images together so you can get a full 360 degree fake view that it actually makes it look like you're going around. I also took a texture from the bottom here. You can see that texture down here. Uh, it's a real desert texture. So I have a lot of work to do with this uh, when it comes down to understanding uh, how this all functions. And you can actually go through and make the determination or see that I have some work to do when it comes to the, uh, to the animation down at the lowest level. So it's uh, clearly not to not blend it in like it should be. Or I, I should say, it doesn't look natural. You can actually see the pixelation as you turn around. And with the skybox, I didn't put a roof on it, so you can actually see that there's no roof on this. So it's a little bit incomplete. I could have been a little bit less lazy and put a, a blue uh, color on top. And my my spaceship on the exterior is this. And what I did was uh, I just had a cylinder at the bottom a small cylinder down here at the bottom that has that goes up maybe two two units or point two units of uh, open geo units and I pretty well want to texture to out extra which you get up close and you can actually see that the texture still retains its resolution pretty well and I also on top of it I have a earth that I superimposed on another texture that I ended up finding and you can see that uh, that looks pretty sweet now I go down, and one other thing that I did for the animation for this is make it so the base unit actually spins around by pressing the 9 and 0 keys. So that, right there, is the base unit moving around. It could look like a UFO. You could spin it up real fast if you want, or you could slow it back down. There's the slowdown right there. Now, Clearly, I did a little bit more work on this than, uh, than what uh, Nihi had on the OpenGL stuff, if you're paying attention. Um, one other feature of this, too, is this is 40 units by 40 units. That's my canvas size. That's what I'm calling it. And you can actually see over here where the skybox, that's what they call it, ends. You can see that ending over there. And what I've done is you can actually see, you know, the terrain, uh, my terrain here end over there. So this is 40 units right there, and that's 100 units away. Now, in the future, what I'll probably do is a cylindrical se uh, section and texture map the entire thing so we don't get the, the effect of every time it reaches a corner, it dips down. 
like it does in each one of these corners. So it goes up, goes down, goes up again a little bit, goes back down. That's not just a feature of the images, that's a feature of the fact that I put this in a square. And that's what's causing the problems. And the other thing you can do is go underneath. There's nothing underneath that you're going to say other than the super texture. Now, some problems with this, the way I look at things is, if you get fruit farther away from there, you start seeing that that texture bleeds through. Yeah, that, that texture bleeds through. And you can actually see that uh, that, that texture is uh, coming through and giving it some really bad look, you know, as you get further, further away. Now, this has something to do with the spacing. If I go right in, inside of it, you might be able to see the spacing in between the two, um, between the, the inter interior and the exterior. So that exterior wall right there is actually giving that problem with that uh, as you get further away. So this for me was a learning exercise just to actually see a little bit of an animation. Um, I took the lights off on this one, so they're... The lights are turned off on the texture. So these are just with the clean textures without lights, OpenGL lights applied. And I ended up having quite a few problems trying to dive into the lighting. And um, depth testing is on, but the lighting was my biggest bear with this exercise. So coming back to back to the project itself, uh, what I did was um, I've got some some objects that I created. So I'm making this open uh, OpenGL more or less object oriented. And over here, I've got the project itself that I leveraged the objects that I had from before. So I've got an atom, a circle, a cone. Now, I didn't really use any of these. I just ported, ported them over, and I more or less grabbed code from them for, for now, with the exception of the geo skin object, which I actually used down here. Now, that geo skin object has a uh, few little features I included with it. It just allows you to very quickly allocate a, a texture. And if you go look at that texture itself, you can see that I do the bind texture right here. And you can scale it on the fly. So if you've got, uh, if you want to stretch this over certain sections and everything, um, that's standard OpenGL stuff. So a couple of things that I've been doing, and also um, at the end for the, for the delete, um, it handles all the wrap-up for all, all the memory allocations that's actually done within the project itself. So, it actually, if you take a look at, uh, so there's, there's actually the uh, allocation for the texture itself. That's where it gets it from the disk. And then from there, it handles the delete. So, we did, at that moment, it'll allocate the, the memory for it. And at that point, everything, you know, should be hunky dory. So what I've done, oh, I also forgot to show you the, uh, the HUD. So if we go over here, bring up that TARDIS project again. Um, I also did a little bit of uh, development for the HUD. So down below, you actually see some of those objects off to the, off to the side. Um, I prototyped them and created a, a Star Trek looking HUD, heads up display is what it's called. Um, I don't have fonts enabled for it yet. But you can turn it off and on with the H key. So that's off, that's on. So that makes it pretty nice. And also, on the other side, I forgot to show you this too, we've got a grid. So you can actually see the grid apply, you know, to see where things are. Now, that should have turned everything red like that, so that's the fault of my code. But the grid itself, you can see here, you can actually see each one of those is one open GL unit. Now, I'm going to equate that to a meter to make it easy. Um, I should probably be doing feet with it, but let's be honest, uh, meters are to some degree a little bit easier when it comes comes to doing flat uh, flat linear textures. So then it actually works out quite well with the uh, with the OpenGL. So some practices that I already got into, here's here's what I ended up doing with the uh, the heads up display. So here's the heads up display up here, draw HUD. And practices that I'm getting into uh, already is with the geo matrix, whenever I get into a matrix, I, I set up the matrix, I load the identity, and then at that point I'll apply textures. In this case, I don't have textures. And then I'll, then I'll switch it over to model view, and at that point I'll actually start the drawing process. Now, in this case right here, um, I've got a, a canvas object that I've created. And if you go over here, geo, not geo premises, over to L cars, I've got a button, a canvas, and a control base. Now, every every control 
has a control base. And the canvas has a control base as its base object. It inherited from it. Button has that as a base object too. In that canvas, uh, I actually will do the left. I'll set the dimensions for it. So with this one, the left is going to be 10 pixels in or whatever. That's actually 10 pixels. The height's going to be 85 pixels. It's going to be screen height minus 100 pixels for the height of the, uh, or for the top of it. And then the width minus 20. Um, it's going to be, so we'll take subtract from the left side that we have done over 10. Well, minus the uh, the other 10 pixels off the right hand side to give us a perfectly, you know, perfect offset on both the right hand and left hand side. Now, I've made up my button object too, and this is going to be standard with any of my displays that I create um, that has the canvas that you set it to, so it's more or less very similar to attaching it to a window. You've got a left and a top, a height and width that you set for that button, which is going to be relative to that canvas. Now, if you don't set that canvas up, this will currently fall. And uh, I also set the foreground colors. What I'm doing is actually naming this based on the L cars, uh, the whole Star Trek, uh, whole world. Now, I started working with captions, and at that point, I kind of started coming across a, a problem with C string. So I ended up creating my own allocation function for C string, and which actually works out pretty slick. So I can actually manage my own or do my own memory management. Um, but I won't get into the problems with that because this is more about OpenGL than it is the design of the user interface, although the user interface does make a difference here. Now, once I've added all these to the canvas, so I have all these different buttons to the canvas, all I have to do is issue a draw command to, the, to that canvas every time. And I don't have to go through the process of recreating that entire scene, you know, once I've done that. And at that point, I've made it a habit to... Because GL is a state machine, which I hear repeated all over the place, which can be really freaking annoying at times, it remembers its state. Um, at this point, what I'm doing is I'm making it a fact to within the retains that I make any changes to that you know that are required for this. I also undo those changes down at the end. Now, pop matrix is supposed to change uh, translational information back. I thought it might handle scale information, but it doesn't necessarily do that. And then for the HUD, the, the last thing that I do is I, I throw it back into the GL perspective mode, which is the three-dimensional mode that it get back, gets back into. Um, now, the function that I created was the draw four. Now, here you actually see where I started, I, I make it a fact to indent everything that I do you know, after I change the matrix mode just for readability so it can make sort of hell of a lot easier to follow. And this at, the, at this point, I switch over the texture. I told it to bind my texture. And at that point, I actually scale that texture to the canvas size. Now, I had canvas size times two. That was a little bit slower because I'm, I'm rendering, you know, copying that image so many times. So I'm going to have to play with that, but I'm also going to have to figure out the, uh, the textures and the way things work in order to get a more realistic ground. I mean, it's a beautiful texture, you know, but the problem is it just doesn't look like the real world, which is what I'm trying to get to. And then I'll switch to, uh, to model view, and like this right here, uh, you can read my notes if you want to, uh, but uh, draw grid is the thing that's responsible for drawing the, the grid, the, the red grid that I showed you. And from there, I end up going through and, and drawing the lines, and and uh, you know, and and from there, I actually go through and I, and I draw the uh, draw the lines for the grid, which are all one meter apart, and then and then the uh, skybox is the last part. Now that's actually where I take the uh, the images that I pulled from uh, from YouTube or from uh, Google Street View, and at that point, I end up tra translating those. Um, so I have. Oh, I shouldn't say trans, I think I've got the sky, the sky box, and I've got uh, the vertexes that I draw for the wall. And all I'm doing for that is placing rectangles, giant rectangles on the wall. Okay. Now, each rectangle is equivalent to about 100 meters across, um, and it uh, sinks down about 20, 20 meters down below the actual um, floor level, just so I can actually have a seamless and make it appear realistic. And from there, I had a problem with the seamlessness because the way that, uh, we'll put it this way, I just I had to rotate the texture from there in order to be able to make that one appear for, you had the front one then first, then the one off the, le or one off the right next. I had to rotate that and then switch it around in order to 
flip it back around. So I drew my, my text coordinates. Now this starts, this is something to understand about, uh, about the coordinates. Um, it starts in the upper left hand corner, that's what the zero, zero means. And then from there, the one is the x and the zero for the next one. So this one right here is the y. Or I, I'm calling it XY. I'm not too sure if it's a, if it means something else. But I go from from the, from the left all the way to the right top, and then from there I go from the, from the, that to the bottom right, and then from there all the way back over to the left. Well, for this one I did it differently because the te the texture actually comes out inverted because it's drawing at a different angle. So I drew these, and this is just all this is doing is gathering that information from the bitmap on the disk and then displaying it on the separate vertexes that I'm drawing for the rectangle. So from there, I did that for the next one. Um, I unrotate it because anyth anything that I do, my own personal rule that I have is anything I do for rotation or translation, I undo. So this one, I rotated that texture 90 degrees and then I rotate unrotate it back 90 degrees. So from there, I do the same thing for the next texture. I rotate that, go back, and then from there, I draw the final piece, which which had, had completes the skybox altogether. Now, the last thing, or I shouldn't say the last. Yeah, this is the last thing. The draw room, I I go through, and this is actually part of the uh, Niki's um, you know tutorial. Um, I extracted this, and I actually get a quadratic. I could probably trim this out even further and get this once. This gets it every time. And then from there, I actually start the process of drawing separate objects. Now, the thing to note, here's how I do the rotation, which is just more or less a translation for everything that comes through. And to also know, I do a translation, and then I undo that translation right after that, too. So anytime I have any kind of movement of perspective, I always reset it back to the way I originally received, which is to, I don't know, it seems to be a nice habit that I'm, that I'm in that, uh, you know, that kind of respects the drawing and makes it easier to, to figure things out later, especially after all the crap that I went through from putting this together. So this right here, I, I actually, uh, this right here is the main section, so you can actually see that I'm drawing the cylinder, which is the rotating cylinder part. So if I come back over here, you can see that this rotating cylinder is moving by the x, y, my x and my y, which is defined as a constant above. And then from there, I actually handle the translation, the rotation of it. You know, so at that point, I'm actually saying I want this one to be a little bit off the floor, which gives me this look if that actually separates that from the ground texture that can actually rotate down there. That piece right there. And from there, I actually, I'll go through and I'll rotate that texture back because, or um, rotate the, uh, the object back. So my x, y axis, I'm still trying to figure out something with my x, y axis. So that's why I'm doing all those rotations for this. So I'll be the first to admit I'm still learning this crap. But the, uh, the rotations, especially with the x, y, it was making more sense for me to rotate this. And so I can actually understand the x, y axis and location information for it. And then uh, the texture itself, I take that texture and I scale it. So 12 times, or actually, um, I actually it's more or less a reduction of what's going on here. That's it. That's taking that, uh, that bitmap. Rather than taking it all the way one, I'm, this is more or less being copied 12 times all around. So it's one bitmap. If you go look at this thing on disk, it's going to keep on rotating until I press that. That's where it senses that stop key. If you go take a look at that texture on disk, that one's a little futuristic. Here's the texture on disk. So it's just that one texture is being repeated a number of times right here. So 12 times altogether. That's all that's saying. And then, in order for me to back out of that scale, I'll, I'll actually take that and I'll, uh, I'll reduce it by 1 over 12. Now, if I don't do that, that screws up the rest of my model. And what you'll see is everything from then on will actually start getting messed up and start spinning around too fast, you know, because of my, my um, 
axis changes and everything over time. Even if I took that out, um, the textures wouldn't come across right. So I just make it a fact to undo anything I do right after the operation I do it. So again, I rotate, I draw the cylinder for the chandelier section of things, and then I unrotate it. So if you go take a look at this, I'll scroll up a little bit so you can see the chandelier portion of things. So I draw that, you know, and that's that at that point, say, it's got a little bit of an edge to it, so that right there is the left, or the, uh, the top of it, and that right there is the bottom of it. And then from there, I'll go through and I'll, and I'll do the, uh, the disc portion, which is putting a lid on the thing underneath it. So if you take a look right here, you see that there's a lid to it, and all that is is just a little disc. So it's a circular disc that's 0 0.03 meters in diameter. And from there, I start drawing the ceiling, the ceiling texture, which this is the, the vibrant piece that's, that's moving. And I do the same thing. Disc, rotate, and I keep on doing the same thing over and over again. So, you know, drawing, drawing the separate objects. Now, I ended up, um, I have the geo primitives that I could have used for it, but I was having all kinds of problems with the geo rotation, translate, and the drawing functions. I was finding that there wasn't a really good standard way to do this. And because of that, I actually extracted the code from my objects. Let's say here's, for instance, how oh, sphere's not necessarily as applicable. We'll go into um, the disk. So at this point, you've got a disk. Well, you know what? Let's make it a little bit easier. Where's the circle? There's a circle. So the circle, you know, I've got to, at this point, nothing in the circle. So it's drawing a flat-out circle. Well, you know, at this point, I've got the capability to be able to extract things such as the, the inner diameter right there, the outer diameter, um, the number of segments to use for that circle. But the problem comes down to what have I gained by the abstraction of putting this into an object? And to be honest, I've actually lost something because I'm adding functional functional requests to this, when I can actually make the GL, uh, GL call directly right here. So in this case here, an object abstraction isn't going to work to my best advantage. Where the GL uh, skin does because I'm reusing that all over the place. So I'm finding the object oriented aspect of things. It's on a, on a need, to, need to use basis. It's, it's not something I I, at first time, I thought I'd be able to use objects all over the place, but I'm finding that's quite the opposite at this point. Now, the, the elements, though, for the for the elements over here, the LCARS elements, you know, that stands for Library Computer Access Retrieval System, if you're a Star Trek fan. Uh, that actually handles um, the, the creation of those objects, and you can see it handles the uh, calculation of those in a pretty complex little format. Um, that actually uh, goes through and it gets the vertices uh, based on the canvas, you know, and the positional information that you're, you're drawing this way. You know, so it's not exactly a, a, I mean, it's a pretty complex little deal that goes through and does a draw for a simple button just to get one of those cool little, you know, circles down here, you know, two circles and a rectangle. Now, to actually get those captions working, it's going to be an excellent bit of a thing. So, I, I've got a, got a little bit of work to figure out when it comes down to doing that. But when it comes down to GL, I've got myself a list of to-do things. So here's some of the calculation information it sets up. And I also can turn on the grid. I can turn the room on. And I don't think I've demonstrated that. So R, so that actually shows the room, room, no room. So I can actually move around, and you can see the speed difference, because it's actually not even rendering any of those objects. And there it is. So it's a, it's a hell of a lot slower, you know, with that rendering. So I could probably work on the efficiency of that a little bit. Um, but this is the, for me, what I'm calling version 1.0 of this thing. So on the version 2.0 that I'm going to be working on, um, the train doesn't look real. So I'm going to work on the jaggy effects for that. Um, the next model will focus on basic objects with realism, blending, materials, and lighting. I really got to work on that lighting. Um, the skybox, again, I, I complained about that. I've still got some things to fix with that. And it looks decent, but it's still heavy with the size of the texture. The bitmaps are freaking huge. You can actually see the size of these things. 
uh, Desert Crack is 12, 12 days. That's not compressed up bit by the way. And these right here are 1024 by 1024. So I'm going to figure out a better way to actually store those things. So just to actually, what I'd like to store it as a resource. And the next version will also work on, on view ports, more or less a bigger on the inside type deal. So what I would like to do is get this thing functioning much like a, a TARDIS would. The end goal, after all, with, with my development for this, at least this portion of the project, is to create something where you have a simple telephone-like booth that you can walk into, and this is what you see when you walk on the inside. So anyways, that's about it for now, and uh, thank you for listening.